Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Portland's Friday Forum, Oregon's premier public affairs forum. I'm Jim Zarin, President of the City Club, and I welcome you all, those of you here at the Governor Hotel, and those of you listening on OPB-FM or KBPS AM radio or watching on cable television. Thank you for joining us for this week's Friday Forum on this Friday the 13th of March 2009. Today we're going to hear from a professor of economics at Portland State University who will outline the idea of a sustainable New Deal as a policy response to the current economic crisis in this country and other global challenges. But first, a few announcements. Uh, in consideration of those sitting close to you and those in our radio and television audiences, I ask that everyone in the room shut off your cell phone and any other device that may make noise if you haven't already done so. With this Friday Forum, we are beginning a new quarter here at City Club, and as such, we are pleased to welcome three new Friday Forum corporate sponsors for the new quarter. Without the generous financial support of our corporate sponsors, these time-honored City Club Friday Forum luncheons would not be possible. Our corporate sponsors for this quarter are Northwest Natural, the law firm Schwabe, Williamson & Wyatt, and Portland General Electric. Let's give these sponsors a warm welcome as our Friday Forum sponsor for this new quarter. Now at this time I'd like to introduce the club's treasurer, Ted Kay, uh, for a special announcement. Uh, and as Ted comes up, Ted is Vice President for Finance at Teledirect International here in Portland. Uh, Ted has been a City Club member since 1990 uh, and has been a member of the Board of Governors since 2007. Ted? Thank you, Jim. City Club's spring membership drives kick, drive kicks off this month. Not only maintaining but actually growing our current 1,400 person membership is absolutely critical to the club's ability to serve the community in these difficult times. Indeed, joining City Club, renewing our memberships, and recruiting new members are all things each of us can do without great personal sacrifice to keep City Club funded and vital. As such, if you have been considering joining City Club, this is a great time to do so. If you've let your membership lapse, this is also a great time to renew. And if you have friends and colleagues who should belong to City Club, now is the time for you to invite them to join. And as you prepare your federal and state income tax returns, remember, Membership dues are fully tax deductible, so the out-of-pocket cost of City Club membership for most is discounted some 25 to 40 percent. During this campaign, the club is waiving the $25 new member fee, both for new members and for lapsed members who return. And as an added bonus, during this membership drive, when a new member joins and acknowledges a current member as the recruiter, both will receive a voucher for a free Friday Forum lunch. Membership brochures are at each of your tables and at the membership table in the back, so you non-members, please pick one up and fill it out now or when you return to work or home. You can also go to the City Club website for more information on membership. But however you go about it, please support City Club. We need our friends and members to become and remain dues-paying members to support this 93-year-old civic institution now more than ever. Thank you. Thank you, Ted. And as uh, board chair, I just want to underscore his comments. Uh, I'm sure at every table we have City Club members. So I invite and encourage those of you who are members to uh, Shanghai, uh, caress, whatever you need to do, others at your table to uh, get them to pony up and join. This is very important for the club's vitality in this uh, difficult economic climate. We're going to hear a lot about uh, the world economic situation. It is affecting City Club, so please help. Uh, and in this regard, we're, I'm pleased that we have uh, two new members that I would like to stand and be recognized. Please hold your applause. Uh, Linda uh, Lavallee, who's the director of the Portland Parks Foundation, 
and Kevin Heaney, Vice President for Constituent Development of the OSU Foundation. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Now, everyone is invited to a week of programs of the club's Agora group at the end of this month. On March 24th, a panel on primary medical care. On March 25th, the Citizens Read Book Club, for which you could purchase the book, Danced Lest We All Fall Down at the back of the room on your way out. Uh, all the proceeds from this sale will actually go to the uh, uh, Brazilian educational school that the book is about. Uh, uh, and then on March 26th, Agora also is sponsoring another program on the subject of human trafficking. Uh, we're also pleased to announce that there are two new events of the club's New Leaders Council this month. First on March 19th, a backstage tour of the Broadway musical Wicked. And second on March 26th, a spring happy hour event. And next week here at Friday Forum, City Club welcomes uh, Meryl Reddish of the Audubon Society of Portland. Uh, and Michelle Bussard uh, uh, of the Forest Park Conservancy. Uh, the two of them will address the future of Portland's increasingly threatened Forest Park. Now to learn about these and other City Club events, please see the club's weekly bulletin or go to the City Club website. And now to our program for today. In American society right now, and seemingly in industrialized societies virtually throughout the world, there are dramatic and historic forces at play relating to what seem to be three fundamental themes. First, the apparent near collapse of a consumer-oriented, debt-driven economic model. Second, a sense that the era of reliance on oil as a primary source of energy is drawing to an end. And finally, a realization that climate change is for real and threatens life on the planet as we know it. Now the elephant in the room, of course, is what do we do about these huge challenges? How indeed do we successfully restructure our economy, decrease our dependence on oil, and address climate change, and do so simultaneously? Well, today we are fortunate to have with us a faculty member of our own Portland State University who has given a lot of thought to these kinds of issues, and who will share with us her framework for thinking about the kind of transformation we need to make in our economic and political culture. <clears throat> our speaker is a professor in the economics department at Portland State. She is a labor economist, and one of her current research and teaching interests is the economics of sustainability. She co-teaches a graduate course on the social aspect of sustainability, which is part of PSU's graduate certificate in sustainability. And she and other PSU faculty have collaborated on a recently published book entitled understanding the social dimension of sustainability. Our speaker received her BA in economics at Stanford University, studied international relations as a Rhodes Scholar in, at Oxford, and earned her PhD in economics at UC Berkeley. <clears throat> she joined the faculty of PSU in 1992. Now, on a personal note, I have learned that our speaker seems to have a special connection to urban street life. For example, before becoming an academic, she worked for a year as a bike messenger navigating the streets of San Francisco. And it was in that job that she met her future husband. She was number 219 on the bike messenger radio and he was number 224. And while in San Francisco, she participated three times in the San Francisco Carnival Parade as a member of an Afro-Haitian dance group led by Blanche Brown, the wife of Willie Brown, the longtime speaker of the California State Assembly and later mayor of San Francisco. But lest you think that she left this kind of street presence in the streets of San Francisco, I also want to report that our speaker was a dance member of the Lions of Batucada, I think I got that right, which she describes as, quote, the best samba band in the Northern Hemisphere a few years ago in the Portland Starlight Parade. Somehow my image of my college economic professors are a little different than that. I don't know about the rest of you. <laughs> but whether or not she will show us her street, uh, stance, uh, street dancing skills, she is here with us today for her second visit to the City Club Friday Forum microphone to outline her vision for what she calls a sustainable New Deal. Please give a City Club uh, welcome to PSU Professor of Economics, Dr. Mary King. Mary? Thank you, good afternoon. I wasn't the best dancer. 
And so I had to be an economist. And that's why I'm here today. I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today on a topic of a sustainable New Deal. It's an honor and a pleasure. I appreciate it, and I want to particularly thank and recognize the work that Jeannie Crouch and Joe Sixta are doing to organize programs on the economic situation for the um, City Club. I want to take the chance to talk to you about three different things today. A friend of mine who's a much better public speaker than I tells me it's entirely too much, and she might be right. I do want to hit on three things, though. The genesis of the economic and financial crisis, because we need to remember this and keep this in our minds to keep from repeating this history, and because the political spinning is so strong just now to keep everyone's political agendas alive regardless of the facts. The second big topic is the argument for a big fiscal stimulus by the federal government and why it should be tilted as much as possible toward government spending and away from tax cuts. And the third is the case for a stimulus that's a sustainable New Deal in order both to put people back to work in a hurry and to make the most of our money in the process by investing in human capacities, transformative green infrastructure, and also to take this moment to reconsider our growth model, our economic model. Right? The growth and expansion is imperative in the model we have at the present. It's not just, but it's not just enormous returns on finance that are unsustainable. It's also a business model that seeks growth and expansion above all else. But first, to set the stage, I need to give you a little fire and brimstone. We need to be clear that the current, financial, the current economic crisis was set off by a lack of effective regulatory oversight of the financial markets, which allowed a bubble to become huge and in popping to drag us all down. In publicity for the talk today, the causal factor for the economic crisis was described as a collapse in the housing market. I don't think that's completely accurate. I think we certainly had a bubble in the housing market. We had a bubble the previous decade in stocks for high tech. And we've had many bubbles in financial crises before that. The problem was the bubble rather than the housing market, really. Bubbles are a phenomenon unique to markets, and the impact of them is exacerbated by debt. Bubbles are created by people who, when you see that the price of something is going up, whether it's housing, whether it's high tech stocks, or whether it's back in the 17th century tulip bulbs in Holland, people jump in. They think, the price of this is going up, it will never go down, if I can only get in now, this is a sure thing, all the smartest people are doing it, I'm in. And if they think it's such a good deal that they borrow money to do it, that's where you get a bubble that's going to crash and be dangerous. That's exactly what we just had happen. There's a book on this which I would love to quote you at length. John Kenneth Galbraith has written a wonderful book, short, funny, called A Short History of Financial Euphoria. And I would quote it all day. He wrote it in 1990. He was. Uh, it built on a long essay that he'd written in the aftermath of the savings and loan fiasco in the 1980s and what we thought then was the stock market meltdown. Remember that? Doesn't look so bad now. I promise you, you will think he wrote the book yesterday. It describes so clearly exactly what just happened on Wall Street. Galbraith makes several critical points. The first one is that bubbles always involve new debt instruments, which people think are great innovations. It's a great new invention. As Galbraith says, the world of finance hails the invention of the wheel over and over again, usually in a more unstable version than the last. That we saw. He second, he says that the debt is allowed to grow dangerously out of scale to the underlying means of payment, i.e., Financiers are perilously over-leveraged, which I'll explain a bit more in a minute, although probably many of you understand that. And third, that because so much money is being made on the way up with a bubble, that people allow themselves to believe that those making money are smarter than everybody else in the room, and that people doing it believe it as well. And that has dangerous consequences, which also played out recently. So as I say, this is just exactly what just happened on Wall Street. The most egregious new instruments, as you know, were the derivatives based on packaging subprime mortgages and the credit default swaps being sold by AIG. 
Those credit default swaps sounded like insurance, should have been regulated like insurance, but since they had a new name, AIG got away with diverting the revenue from their sale into profits and didn't put away the solid cushion they would have had to in a customary insurance arrangement. Not coincidentally, AIG is bankrupt and now we own it, really. Second, the investment houses were dangerously overleveraged. After the Great Depression, in which overleveraging had played a real factor, regulation held commercial banks to being leveraged at about 10 to 1, which meant they could loan out about 10 times as much as they had in assets on deposit. 10 to 1. The investment houses are reported to have gotten out at 30, 40, some people even say 60 to 1. And the problem with overleveraging is you can't handle a drop in the price of the asset that you own, that is the part that you own, or the overall asset really. A drop in the price that you ought to be expect to be well within the range of a normal business future. So for instance, an example, to make it clear to people, if you aren't familiar with the concept of leveraging, leveraging at 30 to 1 is buying a house with $3,000 and getting a mortgage of 100000 That's 30 to 1. If you buy that house worth $103,000 and the price rises, even $3,000 to $106,000, you're a genius. You have doubled your money. Your $3,000 became $6,000. Everybody wants to invest with you. But if the price of the house falls $3,000, not even 3%, you've lost everything. All you have left is the mortgage. If the price of the house drops to 97000 not even a 6% fall, something you ought to be ready to stand, you have lost all your money. You have lost twice what you had in there. You have to sell that house to pay off the mortgage, and you are still in the hole. You have to sell something else to pay it off. If you and all your best friends did the same thing, everybody's selling their house to pay it off, and the price of the house is just go down further. That's what's happened on Wall Street. Okay. Now the investment houses were lightly regulated because they didn't meet the exact definition of the kinds of financial institutions that were described by the regulations put in place after the Great Depression. But they also persuaded the SEC to water down the regulation that did exist. Merrill Lynch, Goldman Sachs, led at the time by Henry Paulson, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stern, Morgan Stanley, all pushed for exemption to regulations that did exist. In 2004, they persuaded the SEC that they had plenty of capital, that they could safely be leveraged out at far higher ratios. They were wrong. All five of them are gone now. They're all bankrupt, sold, or transformed into commercial banks that are more regulated. Which brings us to Galbraith's third point, that on the way up, when the bubble is growing, the people driving it look brilliant. We all think they're smarter than everybody else. And anybody who tries to call a halt is described as lacking an understanding of finance, envious of wealth, lacking faith in the wisdom of the markets, which will regulate themselves. We saw this spectacularly. I don't know if you remember in the year 2000 when Alan Greenspan and Larry Summers went to Congress to keep the new derivatives market from being more regulated. It was widely reported at the time. You can now see online the picture of Time magazine with Rubin, Greenspan, and Summers being described as having saved the world by keeping regulators from touching the derivatives market. Thanks, guys. We're really grateful. You know, Larry Summers was reported to have browbeat Brooksley Bourne. Brooksley Bourne was the chair of the Community Commodity Futures Trading Commission in the late 1990s. And she was arguing that unregulated derivatives market posed a serious systemic risk. She was putting in place a framework for oversight. Brooksley just didn't understand finance, and she lost but we might have been better off. A lot of people, like Alan Greenspan, were persuaded that market forces and self-interest would keep financiers from taking excessive risks, but they weren't the only voices. Along with people like Brooksley Bourne were other economists like Nobel Prize winner George Akerlof. 
After the financial crisis of the 80s, Akerlof published a paper called Looters. And what he was describing was really financiers who perceived that they could take very risky bets because if they lost, everyone would think they were too big to fail and their losses would be absorbed by the taxpayers. But if they won these risky bets, they would make fortunes. And they did. So we have to rethink this whole too big to fail thing. I think it's quite possible that if you're too big to fail, you're too big to be other than very closely regulated and maybe quite possibly too big to be private. The publicly held banks in Germany and Brazil are not experiencing the same challenges that the rest of the banking world is facing. And then, of course, there's always the question of fraud, not only on the part of people like Bernie Madoff, but in the subprime mortgage market that touched off a lot of this. Probably some of you were, along with me, refinancing your houses in 2003. The whole world was in there. Histor rent interest rates were at an historic low. And my credit union, a local institution, which I assumed would have the interests of consumers at heart as much as anyone, was pushing adjustable rate mortgages with balloon payments down the road. I was appalled. It's an amazing thing to see because there we were all being encouraged to bet on the fact that the price of our houses would rise and rise quickly. That was what that bet had to be, to take an adjustable rate mortgage with a balloon payment at that point. So I understand people who feel, oh, I did the responsible thing, you know. I did in 2003, I got a fixed rate mortgage at a low interest rate. But I also feel a lot of sympathy for people who were sold those adjustable rate mortgages with balloon payments. A lot of people were sold products they didn't really understand and they couldn't afford. And I, we used to, it used to be part of the job of bankers to make sure that people could afford the payments they were about to have to pay. And we lost that understanding. We lost that. And there's something of a looting dynamic in the loss of that understanding. So while many people are saying that we're in uncharted territory and no one saw this coming, it's not the case. A lot of people who saw it coming were argued down and the regulation that might have prevented some of this happening, the regulation that was put in place after the Great Depression, was not extended to cover new financial instruments and institutions. What it did cover was gradually dismantled on the basis of a long-term lobbying campaign by financial industry and their allies, like Alan Greenspan, who has now realized that his faith in the ability of markets to self-regulate was misplaced. So we find ourselves in an economic crisis touched off by the financial crisis, showing up as climbing unemployment rates and falling GDP, not just here in the US, but in much of the world. And there's at this moment a remarkable consensus among economists that we urgently need a massive fiscal stimulus, meaning an increase in government spending and or tax cuts, despite the deficit that we come into this with, which has grown enormous over the last eight years of tax cuts and war spending. We need to put purchasing power in the hands of consumers to counter layoffs in the private sector and to counter cuts in public spending that will happen as taxable incomes fall, to stop and reverse the sort of downward spiral that the economy is headed in. Fiscal policy is required. We are in that classic scenario described by Keynes in the 30s when businesses can't be expected to pull us out of it. They cannot be expected to invest, hire, and produce if they can't see a market for their goods out there in the near future. We can't rely on monetary policy because interest rates are as low as they can go. People are fearful of deflation, which we last saw in this country in the Great Depression. Deflation sounds good. To those of us who have only experienced constantly rising prices, you think, deflation, cool, finally. You know, I'm going to pay less. But it's very scary. If prices are falling, that means that you have businesses in the situation of not being able to cover their costs. If they're paying people and purchasing inputs now, but the prices that they'll get for what they sell are lower in the future, they're stuck. They can't work that way. So deflation is very scary. And around the world, people are calling for a fiscal stimulus. 
The, pri the big arguments over it are not whether to do it really anymore, it's how big it ought to be, whether or not what the Obama administration's doing, what the EU is doing, what Japan is doing is enough. Christina Romer, who's the current chair of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, is quite optimistic. Like Bernanke at the Fed, she's a scholar of the Great Depression when they went against everything people thought they knew in order to do some sort of a fiscal stimulus, but they did too little and they stopped too soon, and we weren't pulled out of the Great Depression until the big deficit spending of World War II. Christina Romer says we've learned the lesson of the Depression, and we're spending enough to counter the decline, and we'll continue that spending over the next few years. I really, really, really hope she's right. Others feel that the stimulus bill is too little, that 3% of GDP, say $900 billion over the next two years, is just the minimum that we ought to be spending, and that the more we structure the stimulus in the form of tax cuts, the more we're going to have to spend in the end, or the bigger deficits we're going to have to carry. This has been the other big argument around the stimulus, how much in tax cuts, how much in direct spending. They hit the government budget the very same way. They both create the same level of deficit, but the way that they differ is the way in which they hit the economy, what the impact is on the economy. So the argument on this is far more political than economic. The economists are in fair agreement. I went to the big annual gathering of American economists in early January this year, and the big names were presenting, oh, what is our evidence on the history of the recent tax cuts? There wasn't a lot of stimulus from those recent tax cuts is what the evidence is. So the economists are not necessarily out there calling for tax cuts. The other reason is gets expressed in the, the language of multipliers, which is just another way of coming out. What do you get for your spending? Your multiplier is the bang for the buck. What is the multiplier on one form of spending or that form of tax cuts? And multipliers, they're really, they measure the ripple effect. If you spend money, what you spend that, and then what do you get for it? What all comes out of it? Multipliers will be low or even zero in times of full employment. So we've heard a lot of argument about multipliers recently. There's not a lot of argument that multipliers exist when people are unemployed and resources are unemployed. That's the case when multipliers are high. And they're higher for government spending than for tax cuts. The reason is that all of the money in government spending gets spent, at least at the first layer. None of it gets saved. None of it gets used to pay off debt. It all gets spent. And then it gets spent. At that point, the people who get it, say you do some sort of stimulus, let's build a subway. You spend all that money to build the subway. You hire the people. You put the machines. You put it out there. OK, those subway workers. They have more income than they would have had. They go off and they buy shoes with it. Those shoes, they save a little, they buy some shoes. The people who are selling shoes save a little, buy some shoes, buy some childcare. The childcare workers save a little, buy some groceries. And it goes on like that. You get that ripple effect. You add up all those things and that constitutes the multiplier. But you start out with none of it having been saved or used to spend down debt in the very first layer. If you start out with a tax cut, some piece of that from the very beginning gets saved, and that's why the multipliers are lower on tax cuts. Now, so there's a logic to it, and we work everybody through it at even greater length in introductory economics, but maybe more persuasive to most people is not the logic, but the measurements that people have attempted to do. And you can see a lot of these measured multipliers. You can go up on the Congressional Budget Office webpage and have a look at the multipliers they've estimated. They're very comparable also. Others that are being looked at a lot are by Mark Zandi from uh, Moody's, economy.com, getting quoted. Zandi's multipliers, or Zandi makes the case that the very biggest multipliers, the biggest bang for the buck in any kind of stimulus will come from spending on increasing food stamps, temporary food stamp increases, extending unemployment insurance, and infrastructure spending. These generate multipliers. He estimates it's something in the order of between 1.5, 1.75. The lowest multipliers come from tax cuts. He, um, he estimates it about 0 0.3 multipliers of making the Bush income tax cuts permanent or the capital gains and dividend tax cuts permanent, cuts in the corporate tax rate, this kind of thing. Accelerated depreciation is the absolute lowest at 0 
Okay, so the first, the multipliers are really the first way we can think about how can we figure out how we should structure a stimulus to see where the impact is going to be. Another important metric is jobs. How many jobs are going to be created by different kinds of spending? And how many jobs get created is determined by how labor intensive or capital intensive an industry where you invest is, excuse me for that sentence, is by how labor or capital intensive an industry is that gets the focus of stimulus spending. Okay, so the very high, highest numbers of jobs that get created will be in the most labor intensive industries. This is something like healthcare, education, social services. You put a lot of people to work and therefore you create a lot of jobs. Next, it's something like infrastructure and technology. And last are the kinds of spendings like military hardware because those are such capital intensive industries. Now, I've billed this talk as a focus on a sustainable New Deal and spent my time on uh, what went on in Wall Street and how to figure out what a stimulus should be. And I want to spend just a little bit of time on talking about how the uh, stimulus and New Deal could be sustainable. Certainly we need another New Deal, as in the 1930s. We need a substantial fiscal stimulus to counteract unemployment and real hardship. Government spending on almost anything labor intensive will give us both a decent multiplier and a lot of jobs. Keynes is famous for having said, let's hire people, we could hire people to dig holes in the ground and then fill them up. But it's maybe not our best policy at this moment. Janet Yellen, who was head of the San Francisco Federal Reserve said, Yes, we need a big fiscal stimulus, and we ought to spend our money in the way that has the biggest and best social impact. That's the way to think about it. We've been seduced in recent decades in the U.S. by the idea that the market is the best mechanism for figuring out the best use of resources. And markets have their strengths. Market economies are vital. They reward innovation. But a simplistic reliance on markets only has led us to this moment. They're prone to speculative bubbles. They're volatile. They concentrate wealth and create, exacerbate inequality. They encourage risk taking and they direct resources only to people who can pay for them. And for this kind of reason, development economists who think hard about how to spend every dollar for the best impact on people's lives have shifted their thinking about how to measure economic progress, about what the goal is. They have moved away from a simple yardstick of GDP or GDP per capita because they realized that just an encouragement of GDP, a simple GDP growth, didn't deliver necessarily a better life for the world's poorest people. So the UN Development Program now focuses on what they call human development as both the mean and end goals of economic progress. Human development is understood as the development of the capacities of people in all important arenas. Do you have economic capacity, social capacity, political capacity, cultural capacity, that kind of thing? It's the development of a person rather than the size of an economy. And we need to do the same. We need to take charge of our economy again, rather relying solely on market forces to steer our resources based on nothing more than short-term financial return. Because high returns on financial investments based on bubbles aren't sustainable. We aren't going to get to go back to that. Living on finance while outsourcing our manufacturing isn't sustainable. Relying on an economic model based on growth, expansion, and intensive resource use isn't sustainable. And focusing only on financial gain rather than human development isn't sustainable. So as we think about structuring this stimulus, we need to recognize that in the midst of a crisis, we have a real opportunity. We've really been handed a chance on a platter. All along, you know, everyone who's been thinking, how can we be more sustainable? How can we invest in something different and better? Has been struck by, it's too expensive. We can't do it. Now's the moment when resources and people are unemployed and we have a chance to put it where we think they can create the best use. Now, to think back to Janet Yellen saying we need to prioritize what creates the greatest value, not the, necessarily the highest financial returns, we need to be thinking about human needs, fighting the most serious poverty on the agenda, which is found among the homeless and among single mother families, half of whom who had kids under five were poor last year. We should be thinking about investment in our future productivity, 
which means education and health care as well as physical infrastructure. Often we forget about the contribution of public sector investment in these areas when we think about economic growth, but economists who study growth have attributed more than 80% of our growth over the 20th century to education, not to computers and railroads and all the kinds of things we think of, but education. And if we think about education, think about investment in early childhood education, Head Start, universal pre-care, preschool, all-day kindergarten, those pay extremely high returns. Those are great public investments, but we're tending to think mostly about investment in physical infrastructure. Physical infrastructure is a good thing to invest in. We should do it right now. But we need to be thinking also about human infrastructure. This is our best chance to have everyone well-educated, working for a decent wage and paying taxes, and keeping down expenses on jails and substance abuse and poverty programs out there in the future. So we need to be taking about this unusual opportunity and then also to think about investing in green energy, green infrastructure, and conservation. As John mentioned, we know we have to take climate change seriously now. It's obvious we don't have the resources to end global poverty and raise living standards worldwide using resources in the way that the affluent countries in the U.S. have been able to do. And it's clear politically that we want to shift away from dependence on oil so that we don't structure our foreign policy in the way that we have. This is a moment. People are unemployed and public spending on a grand scale is called for. We can move decisively toward a more sustainable economy. And people have been figuring out how to do it. I, one program that I recommend you look at is put out by the Center for American Progress in conjunction with the University of Massachusetts. They've outlined what they call a green recovery program. And they've figured that investment in six areas, $100 billion will create two million jobs over two years. In these six, they focus on retrofitting buildings for energy efficiency, expanding mass transit and freight rail, constructing smart electrical grid transmission systems, wind power, solar power, and next generation biofuels. So that's sort of the green part. The Institute for America's Future in Washington, D.C. is calling for investment in those areas, supplemented by physical infrastructure modernization and repair, talking about our bridges and that kind of thing, aid to states, which means social services, investment in public education, research and development, health care, aid to those in need, and tax credits for people providing family, elderly, and sick care. So if we're going to be sustainable, we need to direct our investments in ways that make us both, that make us sustainable considered holistically, environmentally, economically, and socially sustainable. And what that means is stimulus spending on green investments, re-regulation of the financial industry, possibly creation of a public segment of our financial industry, investment in infrastructure, physical and human, and investment to build human capacities and meet human needs. Thank you. The first question for our speaker, as always, will be from our Board of Governors host. Our board host today is John Stride. John Stride is a lawyer at the Tonkin Torp Law Firm in Portland. Uh, he has been a City Club member since 1992, and this past year has served not only as a member of the Board of Governors, but has also been chair of our research board. John? Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Professor King, for your comments. There clearly is a tension uh, about what to do with this stimulus spending. On the one hand, do we put it all into in infrastructure where you can see it and feel it and have some immediate utility, or do you push it towards social services or social spending? Uh, clearly, we look back to the Great Depression and the, the WPA projects and so forth, but I suspect if any of us suggested that we build grand lodges like Crater Lake or Timberline, we'd all be roundly criticized. So where does that money go? Is there a case that when you spend the money on education, for example, you create a job, but the result of it is too attenuated? It's on a trained workforce out in the future. Can we really afford to put our money there, or can we afford not to? <laughs> yes. 
Well, it's a good question, and you're right that we've thought about physical infrastructure when we think about investment, and really, today I would like to make the point that they're very comparable. Investment in physical infrastructure and investment in human infrastructure. They both create work right now, and that's a huge goal for this stimulus spending. We want people at work, and one reason to balance physical and human investment is because we want to put everybody to work. Construction in physical infrastructure, those guys are out of work, they're especially out of work, but it's mostly men. We can also put women to work in health and education, that kind of thing. Both of them put people to work right now, both of them have high employment impacts, and both of them provide us productivity through the future. So I don't think it's, you know, there's a short and a long-term benefit to both, and I don't think either of them are particularly geared one way or the other. We have come to think of our government public spending as consumption because of the way we budget in the public sector. It makes no sense. An investment in a bridge is investment. Investment in education is investment. It's not consumption. And so we tie it together with thinking, well, people will eat today and then that's that. But education and health care pays off. We will now take questions from the floor. Uh, asking questions at Friday Forums is a privilege of City Club membership. Please uh, keep your question to 30 seconds or less. Identify yourself as a City Club member. Make sure to ask a question and not give a speech. And we will go till 1.15. Hello, uh, Barbara Wolf, City Club member. Uh, I was, I'm very interested certainly in education and in, in trying to do all the things you say. However, was not the original idea of the stimulus to not only work on the infrastructure of this country, which is crumbling, and also to keep people in their homes. You know, right now, what's happening is people are losing their homes and we are selling them now to foreign investors. And there was a headline that said, we're now becoming a country of renters. It's like we're repeating the history in Ireland years and years ago. Is there nothing we can do in this, as people reach for how do we spend this to actually help the people who are losing their homes? I absolutely agree with you. I think that money needs to go into foreclosures. And, oh, I wish I could remember. There was an excellent op-ed in the New York Times directly oriented toward this point a few days ago, saying we not only need to worry about the immediate foreclosures, but we need to worry about people who are underwater because those people will walk away. And what will we have? No, I think you're absolutely right. Well, I think the answer is that we put money into mortgage renegotiation, you know, that we now own a lot of these financial institutions. We can also require uh, certain kinds of lending and mortgage renegotiation because interest rates are very low. It's a great time to buy a house if you're going to buy it on reasonable sorts of terms. Mm -hmm. Ryan Polani, a City Club member. You mentioned investment in infrastructure, and I suggest that it would be very important that we invest in the right kind of infrastructure. The urban automobile, I think, is unsustainable, not only for fuel, but also for the kind of city and the kind of development that it fosters. So I think the time has come to really pay serious attention to mass transit for the city, and for the suburbs, and also to trains, rail, in between the cities, both freight and passengers. The question is how to fund it. We have been overlooking it, and we have been neglecting it for too long. What do you think? I completely agree. We've starved our mass transit. We've starved our rail. We've taken the attitude that those kinds of things should pay for themselves. Transportation does not pay for itself. It needs to be subsidized and it pays off. It pays off in better business prospects and it pays off in mobility. 
So we are at a moment where we're going to spend money. We'll spend money. You know, it's interesting. I think the lesson of the past eight years is that we only ask where is the money coming from when it's something that seems to be productive to do. We have just spent, we have just encumbered three trillion dollars on the war in Iraq. We haven't asked where is that money coming from, but we ask in the wrong situations, I think. Mass transit is an investment. It will pay us back. War spending will not. Uh, I'm Steve Schell, a member. Dr. King, could you uh, address the TALF TARP situation a little bit, particularly toxic taxes? It looked to me like in the Depression we had things like the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, and in the 80s we had the Resolution Trust Corporation, and, and now we're talking about TARPs and TALFs, and nobody seem, can seem to get out these toxic assets off the off the, the uh, balance sheets of our institutions. Do you think that's going properly or would you do it a different way? I think we have to face facts and mark those things down. They're only worth what they're worth. You know, we can see now, probably you saw the guy from Countrywide, he's still making money. After first creating all those sum prime mortgages, now he's making money selling them off. So there's a market out there, but we can't keep the illusion that they're worth more than what they are. I think this is the real sticking point, the refusal between people who don't want to give up hope that they really are worth what they paid for them. We have to just clean that out and move on. Guinevere Milius, um, City Club member. You mentioned Larry Summers earlier in your talk, and I guess I'm wondering what does it say that um, He's not nominally in charge of this, the Treasury, of course, but he is a senior advisor to the Obama administration on finance. Um, is this sort of handing the keys to the asylum to the inmates, or is it due penance for creating a problem for us? Um, and what do you expect out of his uh, leadership? I was very disappointed to see Larry Summers in that position, I have to say, and I think we're somehow under the sway of the idea that there are a few very smart people and they're going to tell us what to do. And we have given over our ability to think critically. Larry Summers is a man who's gotten himself in trouble in every job he had that I'm aware of. And I don't see why he's in the position he is now. So I'm very hopeful that he won't be there that long. Well, the answer to that may be that Mr. Rubin wasn't available for the job. Uh, my, my question is that uh, concerns your point about expanding public financial institutions. The one I th that occurs to me that does exist at the federal level is uh, Federal Reserve. Can you elaborate on your point there? Well, the Federal Reserve, as I understand it, is the banker's bank. I think we can have banks that function much more in the way we think of as credit unions functioning that are publicly owned and the kind of thing that would be you know, much more focused on local needs. We're, and part of the sustainability is coming back to a local economy and rather than, you know, who knows where our money goes off to when we put it into Bank of America. Just cl clarification, did you when, are you using the term publicly owned there in the corporate, in the, in the, corporate, the corporate sense of uh, stock for sale um, on a public market, or do you mean owned by a public entity like a city, a state, or some other um, creation of, by law, of law? I'm in the latter, like the post office. Hello, my name is <laughs> Hello, my name is Michael B. I am a uh, chair of the Carpenters uh, Local 247's Voluntary Organizing Committee, and I'm a volunteer with Metropolitan Alliance for the Common Good. Um, we're advocating really strongly for um, 
paths to apprenticeship for women and minorities and underserved communities in this work, living wage jobs, and really deep retrofits of 30 to 50 percent uh, energy and carbon reductions in this work. Now, I, I have a question about measures like on-bill financing for retrofits. Is this just another new debt instrument? Um, should we accept measures like this without mandates for consumers and working families? I'm sorry, I didn't quite hear. So the question is about measures like on-bill financing for, uh, for retrofits. Um, and I, I guess what I'm asking is if we should accept measures like this without protections for workers and consumers. I apologize. What financing? What was the word you're using before <laughs> okay. financing? So there's a couple bills in the state legislature. One of them is Energy Efficiency and Sustainable Technology Act. And basically what it proposes to do is uh, roll in the cost of retrofit work into an on-bill financing uh, model, which is, allows you to uh, essentially cut your utility bill with energy efficiency savings and then pay for those savings themselves with uh, your energy bill in a way that is uh, cost neutral. Now, utilities are advocating on the state and the local level for only 10 to 15 percent reductions in energy and carbon. Now, um, I guess kind of what my question is, like, if we're going to come up with really awesome new uh, financing models like this, and there's others, there's the German model for the solar uh, retrofits, should we be uh, presenting these new or accepting these new financing models without protections for workers and consumers and underserved communities? I don't think I really know at all enough about the kind of program you're talking about to comment intelligently. The one thing I would say is I think it makes a lot of sense to distinguish between the kind of deficit financing that happens in the public sector where effectively we, we issue a bond, we raise money, we will pay it off in the future. We are more working along a trajectory of our own future productivity, which is a very different kind of thing than owing a loan to someone else and creating a debt finance. So I think those two things are quite distinct, but other than that, I couldn't comment on the whether or not there are adequate protections in the sort of arrangement that you're discussing. Yes, hello, I'm Don Wagoner, member of City Club. I think um, a number of us probably today are watching all this activity going on back there, and we're hoping, and we may even have voted our hope, but there's all these things happening. Could you uh, uh, talk about a couple of things that are really important that are being forgotten or should be given more, more uh, 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 force by the Obama uh, team? That's a good question. And clearly the big ones that I think are being forgotten are some of this development focus, the human development focus. But the other issue is we tend in bad times to focus on ourselves. And people are pointing out that we are forgetting the rest of the world and that the rest of the world, which has much lower standards of living, which depends on us to export, there's a whole aspect of the global economy which needs to be reworked. And we need to be thinking about how we continue to support, how we do build support for the developing world rather than, you know, focus in on ourselves. Barbara Dudley, City Club member. I want to take you back to the um, impact of investing in health and education now. Not the long-term impact, which you spoke to, but the employment impact immediate employment impact of investing in those two areas. And if you can, as compared to other investments in other projects or enterprises. Thank you. The, well, the, the thing about investment in health, although we have the picture of all kinds of MRIs and pharmaceuticals, it's a very labor intensive enterprise. We also tend to instantly think about doctors and dentists, but 
The vast majority of people employed in health are nurses, are health aides, home health aides, all kinds of people at the lower and middle end of the income bracket. The, I think it's the California nurses have worked out a stimulus plan, have worked out some of the economics of investment in health care, and it bears looking at, there's, it's a different picture than what you sort of conjure up first. Uh, Kurt Wavering member, um, the depression of the 30s was uh, ameliorated by World War II, which created like full employment. But uh, my m memory also is that during World War II, there was a tremendous um, request and demand on households and individuals to save um, energy and, uh, I mean, there was price, uh, gas rationing, um, speed uh, limits, um, victory gardens, things like that which kind of uh, asked the country not to be so consumerist and become more part of the war effort. And I'm just wondering if that kind of thing is missing in what we're hearing now from Washington. That's an excellent point, and it's something I hadn't thought of myself, but you have to think about it when you see people reacting to something like the cap-and-trade proposal as saying, this is just a carbon tax, and you say, yeah, and we should have a carbon tax. We need to change our consumption. If people can bring down their consumption in those areas, we will be better off and shift our spending into something that is more sustainable. So. You raise an excellent point. Hello, Dr. King. My name is Sherry Gardner. I'm a recently unemployed marketing professional. And um, my question is, um, a lot of white collar workers have lost their jobs and are continuing to lose their jobs today. And if the stimulus package is directed towards those in construction and education and health care, how long will it take for it to trickle down to those of us in other industries, um, those of us in finance, marketing, et cetera, and also have these jobs disappeared? And then in addition, if you can also talk about ways that people in these industries can best be positioned to take advantage of the stimulus when it comes down. That would be great. Thank you. That's a tough question. You know, I don't know that I have much to say about it beyond the sort of general thinking of what, does in, what are industries structured? How much is administration? Certainly when we think of construction, we first think about the guys behind the shovel. But there's, of course, administration in all these industries and in proposals, as well as in healthcare. So there's work to be done there. As the when will it all trickle down is the question of the multiplier and the timing of it. You know, that we, we want to see that money spent up front rather than in tax cuts. You want to front load it as much as possible. And then I think Christina Romer's point is well taken though. You can't front load it to the extent that you figure you'll be done in a year. That we need to have a plan. This, this recession doesn't look like it's going to be done in a year. We need to be ready to be continuing to provide support over the next two, three years. Mm -hmm. As to what you should do, should you immediately, you know, enroll in some sort of green electrician apprenticeship? I don't know. Nancy Klein, member. I was just wondering, do you think there is a role for a Teddy Roosevelt-style breakup of these large corporations, particularly given the too-big-to-fail syndrome? I'm sorry, I, I didn't clearly understand your question. Okay, do you think there's a role to be played by, it, uh, by a Teddy Roosevelt style break up large corporations, particularly given the too big to fail syndrome? 
That's a good question. I think you're right on the too big to fail syndrome. I think we've also lost sight of the size of corporations and what that means in terms of monopoly power in the economy. We've quit thinking about it for some reason because we realize that we can't think on a national level about the economy anymore. And so for some reason we quit thinking about market power because we always defined it as how much of a national market you controlled. But certainly a company that has not only a large chunk of your national market and a large chunk of every other national market is even in, is in, in, in an even greater monopoly position. And we can say that monopolies reduce employment, reduce wages, and raise prices. Those things happen as a result of monopoly power. So I think it's an excellent point that not only do we have to think about whether or not companies are too big to fail, and in that case, too big to be unregulated, but also to think about what the impact of that kind of size has on employment and wages and prices. We need to stop, we're out of time. Uh, join us next week for a presentation on the future of our special forest park that we have here in Portland. Uh, consider buying your discounted books at the Citizen Read, uh, for Citizen Read in the back of the room. And uh, I want to particularly thank our speaker. This demonstrates, uh, I was out of town a couple weeks ago, but apparently we don't always have a full question and answer session here because the speaker goes over the time limit. We had a great substantive presentation uh, today as well as a lot of time for Q&A. Makes for a very successful Friday forum. And I want to uh, ask you to help me thank uh, our own PSUs, Dr. Mary King, and we are adjourned. Thank you.